Okay, does everyone know how to use these? Is that easier than me screaming? Well, welcome to Ways and Means. So when you use these, just make sure you turn it off when you're done so that any of your background noise just doesn't get sent around. Well, welcome. We have a big year ahead of us. Uh, as you know, Ways and Means is tax tasks with many things, including looking at bills that are sent our way, but also, importantly, looking at revenue estimates and coming up with a proposal for our house budget writers. So today, I thought we'd just get organized, get to know each other a little bit. We will start by doing some introductions. We have some staff here who will introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what they do. Then I'd like to go around the room with all of our members here. If you could introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your background, maybe your experience in the house, your experience outside of the house, so we know what kind of perspective you have coming into here. And, uh, and then we'll start to go in more detail about you know, processes and procedures of the committee and get all in sync on that and make a plan for the next few weeks. And uh, then we will break for lunch around 11.30. I have lunch coming in, uh, assortment of sandwiches and drinks and so forth. So hopefully you can stay. We have permission to do that. That's a little unusual to have food in committee rooms, but we have permission to do that on this special day. So, and my hope is that during that time, you will get to know each other more personally. And, you know, the, the best part of serving in the house, I know we have a lot of freshmen in the room, is the committee work. This is where we do the deep dive on policy. This is where you become the experts on these policies. And this is where you'll make the best friends you'll have, right here in this room. So um, we'll have that lunch period. The Republicans will caucus separately uh, from 12.30 to 1.15. And that will be upstairs in LOB 300A. It's a separate room for that purpose. And then we'll reconvene at 1.30 and we'll have the CPA Society of New Hampshire, and they will give us a broad overview of New Hampshire business tax policy. And I will tell you, I just read today, there's an organization that you will come to know called the Tax Foundation, and they give us good records on how is New Hampshire tax policy compared to other states in all different types. And we were ranked seventh in, this, in the country for positive corporate business tax climate, and we just were raised to number six. Yay, so congratulations, that's all of your hard work. So thank you for all of that. So uh, if I could, uh, Chris, would you like to just say hello and introduce yourself and then Jennifer? Thanks. Uh, good morning, Chris Shea, I'm from the Legislative Budget Assistance Office and I, I'll be assisting the committee when you do revenue estimates. But I just wanted to say a quick hello today, especially for the new members. I left a flyer, a little pamphlet on your desk talks about what our office does, trifold, and a business card. So if you have any questions, feel free to email or, or give me a call. I'll be back. I'm just making a quick one today because I got stuff to do back at the office in terms of getting fiscal notes on bills that can be, get introduced so that you can do your committee work. But if there's any quick questions before I take off, I feel happy to try to address it. Thank you. We thank you for everything you do. So Chris is going to be very helpful to us this entire year. We will see a lot of him. So thank you. <laughs> Jennifer, you want to come, come up and say hi? I asked you guys all to speak. I should all. Um, but I'm Jennifer Fuller. I'm your committee. Um, I also work with the Education, Legislative Administration, and Judiciary Committees. Um, so if I'm not here, I'm probably down the hall somewhere or upstairs. Um, our office is on the fourth floor. I can help with um, background research, um, comparative research to what's going on in other states. Um, basically anything that I can do to help you. So I'll be here. Talk to me. Looking forward to this session. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And later on, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the types of things Jennifer can help us with in terms of research for the committee. She will be very, very helpful as we compare bills from year to year, revenues, et cetera. Thank you. Want to come up, Karen? Thank you. Now it is, right? 
Um, I just have a few things to go over. There is no attendance sheets there. That's why I passed out all the mileage sheets um, so you know that we have that. Um, the, there's one copy of the bill that you'll get. Um, as soon as we get them printed, they're still coming from the print shop, so as soon as we get them, I will get you copies. Um, that is the only copy that you'll get, though. For, we won't have any for executive session. That There are extras, but those are supposed to be public. Um, the drawers are all made up, and um, they're all empty at the moment. So if there's any problems with any of the drawers, if you could let me know, and I could switch them around. Um, the name plates, this year we're going to try to use plates for substitute. So if you could please give me back those um, paper name plates when you use them. If you're a substitute on another committee, um, bring them back to me so we'll always have that um, for the And as soon as we get the blocks, you'll all have wooden blocks. So that's about it. Thank you. I can chase mine down from science and tech. I have They're, yours. Oh, okay. Yep, I'll bring it in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Um, I think this would be a good time to just go around the room and introduce yourself to the fellow committee members. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, Representative Rochefort, do, would you like to start? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dave Rocheford. I'm from Littleton. Um, so my background really is I'm from New Hampshire, been raised here, born here, born north of the Notches, and that's where I've been uh, living under that rock my whole life. Um, I'm a pharmacist by profession, and my family has owned pharmacies uh, in the North Country since the 70s, and I actually had a far specialty pharmacy that I started and ran just until about a year ago uh, in Littleton, where I had um, um, been given, presented with the opportunity to sell my business. So uh, relatively newly uh, um, change of life, if you will, uh, sold my business in February, and uh, the company that I'm working for now, uh, when I presented to them this idea of me running for the legislature, they said, great, go ahead, do it as long as you get your work done less that so um and i saw i got put on ways and means i'm like there's no way i'm going to be able to get my work done <laughs> and do this but but uh, no I'm, I'm actually looking very very much looking forward to ways and means uh you know w w as i contemplated which committees to request uh, ways and means was definitely a choice uh of mine primarily because um i didn't think i'd get on it but uh, you know, e e even though I'm a pharmacist by profession, uh, and that's where my, my last 25 years has been, uh, I'm also a business owner and have been a business owner and have developed a business in New Hampshire, grown a business in New Hampshire. So much as I claim to be a pharmacist, it's the business part of things that gets me going. In the so uh, I'm excited to be here, excited to participate. And, um, can't wait to meet everybody. Thank you. Representative Fellows. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Sally Fellows, I'm a New Hampshire native. I was born in Keene and grew up mostly in Plymouth, and now I live in Holderness. My, di my district is Plymouth, Holderness, and Ashland. Um, I worked at the Department of Education for 30 years, and my expertise is school funding and school finance. And I've had a little bit of exposure to the state budget from that work at the Department of Education. So uh, this is my third term. The first two years were at EDNA, and I'm happy to be here because I love data and I love spreadsheets. So. You came to the right place. <laughs> Representative Schomburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am Representative Tom Schamberg. I'm from Merrimack County 6, the towns of uh, Wilmot and Sutton, which is near New London. Uh, we're off Interstate 89, exits uh, 10 and 11. Uh, this is my fourth term serving on uh, the New Hampshire House Committee on Ways and Means. I'm a retired teacher of 30 years. I have a JD. I'm a former mayor in, in Ohio with 14 and a half years of uh, service. 
I am presently a third term uh, board of selectmen in Wilmot and a six term uh, uh, municipal budget committee for the school district. Uh, my mayor's position and the selectman's position has given me uh, a lot of budget developing background. Uh, I am, like all of you, uh, an advocate for good, fair tax policies for all New Hampshire taxpayers. Uh, I believe treating all the same without advocating for any biased treatment. Uh, during this term, I am hoping that we all can review with an open mind possible avenues of local property or reducing local property taxes, especially for public education. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Ulery. That's my brother. No, it's a, that's an inside joke. Uh, my brother uh, lives over in the uh, Northwood area. He says he pronounces the name Ulery, and I pronounce it Ulery. No, 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 it's, it, it's an inside joke, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Jordan Ullery. I represent the town of Hudson right now. I have formerly represented Hudson, Litchfield, and Pelham. Hudson and Pelham, whatever. You know, more than one term up here, so you get to at least two um, redistricting my term of office. Up in my real life, worked as a well, I was one of the first paramedics in the state, one of the first paramedics in the nation, one of the first registered EMTs in the nation. Uh, done a lot of uh, public health service uh, on the emergency side. And then I did fraud investigations, a private investigator for several um, significant insurance companies, um, mostly looking for uh, <clears throat> people who didn't exactly want to play by the rules. That was a lot of fun if you like watching asphalt grow. <clears throat> a lot of time watching. Uh, served on Ways and Means, helped develop several budgets up here. Uh, had some input, plus and minus. I'm also co-chair for ALEC for the state of New Hampshire. Uh, I'm on their uh, tax and policy task force. Provides a great deal of various other states. Someday, tax policy in New Hampshire will match that of Utah. So, number one, though, so Utah has their governor's office has their traditional governor's office has gold foil wallpaper. I don't think we're going to get that far, but because we don't have well, we we do have gold mines, just not big ones. Ah, uh, that's basically where I am, and if you. Have any questions? I've already seen some emails that I've sent out. I follow uh, the Tax Foundation. There'll be some stuff coming out from Alec because it's so. There are, are a few good things in there, and I think trend is next. Welcome, Representative Southworth. When you get settled, would you mind introducing yourself to the members? Sure. I was so organized, I forgot my wallet and turned around and went. <laughs> well, um, so I'm Tom Southworth. I represent uh, the city of Dover. It's a new district, District 11. has Dover Ward 4, P, e, and Madbury. Um, my background is in public education. I worked 43 years, reading teacher, mainly as a school counselor, and I ended as an administrator. Um, I worked on many budgets. Um, I was a negotiator, so I was used to salaries, language, benefits, that kind of stuff. Um, locally, for Stratford County, I'm on the executive committee, and I chair uh, the revenue committee. And um, then also, I'm selectman for my ward. Um, I like math, so in a way, this committee appealed to me. Though I hadn't done things with billions much before. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, my perception is we've worked well together. As I said to you, math is math. 
so often, regardless of the intentions of a bill, the math needs to work for all of us. So it's not unusual for us to be in agreement. Thank you so much, Representative Ames. Hey, okay, well, thank you for setting up this meeting in a way that enables us all to, to start knowing one another. Um, so I've been here for, uh, this is my 11th year, and um, have, uh, I think, learned a lot during time. Going back, I started out, I went to law school, graduated eight, went on into, uh, to serve in the uh, Peace Corps for years with my wife in the Philippines. Then um, came back and worked in the city of Boston. Uh, for the City of Boston's Model Cities program for four years uh, in the uh, areas of Roxburgh, Dorchester. Then um, moved on from there to state government, where I was uh, general counsel, uh, part of the leadership team, executive office of educational affairs for four years. And then after that, uh, moved over to the uh, State Department of Mental Health, which at that time had jurisdiction with mental illness as well as mental retention. Um, a huge agency. It was still running the, the big old state institution, state schools. They were called schools for the retarded and, and huge state hospital. All of that was closing down, phasing out into a more community based system. So I helped oversee that. I was General Counsel, but I was part of the management. I had at one time 40 lawyers working for me. Next to that. So after that, um, I went into practice on my own and uh, ran on my own little small business uh, um, and mostly worked uh, what was familiar to me, and that was working with or dealing with mental illness or disabilities needed help in getting services. Uh, so that's what I did for a while. Some, some tax work as well. And um, then I came to New Hampshire. For long, I got into the... So um, I, I am uh, always been interested in tax policy. This is the place to get, get into it in... Uh, depth, and I enjoy that part of the work here. As I'm sad, um, we uh, often find a way to a common place in this committee uh, because of the way the numbers work, a lot of it is just just being right on the detail. Uh, I hope we can continue to do that. We will diverge. Uh, um, some parts of it and divergence is the obvious. Representative Almy. That off. Hi, uh, Susan Almy. I've been on this committee for. Uh, 20, uh, this is my 27th year, and it was an accident. And I um, went to, from graduate school, school, and well, while in graduate school, I started 25 years of work overseas in agricultural development and, uh, and research. And um, in my last posting, managed to um, become allergic to third world city air and couldn't do that anymore. Came home, was sitting in a chair, contemplating at the age of 49, become reading novels the rest of my life, and uh, walked into a democratic office and got converted to be a place filler. 
on the, on the ballot. And, and I'm the only one in our group that won. <laughs> but <laughs> but on, I, I had thought in doing that that if I happened to win, it would be an interesting place. And I actually sent a letter around to all of the independents and Democrats in Lebanon, which there were very few Democrats at the time. And I said, um, I think that working with small farmers and high-level researchers and high-level government officials, and government officials and the rest of it, and doing a lot of surveys like that is, and doing budgets, which I've done a lot of, uh, is going to translate to the legislature. And to my surprise, it did. And uh, I'm still here. So um, I've been chair four times. Two of those were during the Great Recession. We don't know if we're facing another of those or we're just going to face a blip uh, coming. But I think it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for us to deal with the revenue estimates this term. I had always regarded it as being somewhat of a looking into a crystal ball, but this time the crystal ball is broken as far as I'm concerned. So we really have to, all of us, bring the life experiences and skills that we bring to this committee, bring it to bear on what can we do to make it more likely that we'll come out with a real uh, a revenue estimate for the budgeters to use, guide them, uh, that is going to actually materialize in some way. Thank you. Representative Jinnigan. I come from, I'm, I'll be serving this year as your vice chairman. And, um, my background started off as an engineering background. I have a bachelor's in chemistry, master's degree in science, Spent about 25 years in the computer uh, software slash engineering space, uh, starting as a programmer in the early days and at career as a um, senior director of about 50. After that, I made a complete career change. Um, obviously, a state rep this is my term. Um, I also decided to get a real estate broker's license. My wife and I had bought some income properties. So I managed the income property, paid brokerage. I also always do tax returns, which sometimes can get a little complex. So, um, I, but I enjoy doing it and less connection with this committee, a lot of tax policy. There. So my background spans from engineering tax, taxes. That will Again, Lori Sanborn. I am a fourth generation New Hampshire native. I represent Bedford. I have been here 12 years, which is really hard to believe. I served on Ways and Means for three terms. I have served under Representative Chairman Almy, as well as Chairman uh, Major and Chairman Stepanak. Uh, I've also served on Commerce and Finance and Rules. Um, we lost some some strength in this committee, but we, we kept some, but we lost, we have, we have a lot of new people here. I was asked to serve as your chair because uh, we really, we need to develop a team here. We need to develop a lot of knowledge here, and we're going to take the time to do that. So I'm very committed to doing that for all of you. So if we're going to do the best we can to provide all the information you need. If I miss something, please let me know. If you need a lot more information on a particular topic, please let me know. You won't need to memorize anything, just so you know. It, we are trying to get to great revenue estimates. I can tell you, though, I am passionate about tax policy, and this is my favorite committee. I am a small business owner myself. I started my career as a banker for many years, and then I went to the insurance industry, and now I uh, help my husband operate his business, one of which is a restaurant, one of which is a small charitable gaming facility, and I do some real estate development myself. 
So I'm very excited to make sure we do a good job for New Hampshire tax policy and, of course, get those revenue predictions as accurate as we can, knowing that we have some, uh, some things working against us this year. But we're going to do the best we can, and I am here to serve all of you. So I look forward to getting, new, getting to know all of you better. Representative Platt. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chairman. As I, this is my third term in the legislature. I first served the first two in science, technology, and energy, so I speak geek very well. And I tried, I'll promise not to do that here. Um, I am from Goffstown. I can't say I'm a New Hampshire native. I came from Massachusetts. I moved up here when I was nine years old. I'm reminded I'm a newcomer, flatlander, not native. Uh, anyway, uh, my life uh, is in the electric utilities industry. I've got a master's in power engineering and an MBA summa cum laude. And uh, I, I first, uh, I'll pick through everything, not through everything, but the uh, pertinent of this committee. I started out in rates and did rate design, cost of service, and wrote a model to do that. And uh, that, that parlayed me into director of financial planning and uh, director of strategic planning assistant of the president unemployed for public service New Hampshire. And I wrote the financial model at Finance Seabrook. Uh, uh, after that, I, I Allied Signal that was all over Asia developing markets using discounted cash flow analysis. So I did that in the native currency uh, everywhere except Turkey. There weren't enough zeros on the calculator for that, uh, the lira. And uh, life, life, a lot of civic activity, uh, several other, oh, my last 10 years was with the Mass Attorney General in the Office of Ratepayer Advocacy, and I represented her at uh, a, a, uh, the Northeast Power Coordinating Council, NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Council, all of the NEPOOL committees you can think of, uh, and then en ended my career and retired. I've been active civically my whole life through JCs and Lions. I'm a past council chair of Lions. I'm treasurer of uh, Lions Sight and Hearing Foundation with a little over a million dollar corpus. I'm treasurer of my local co-op where I live, a Medville Cooperative, uh, uh, 301 homes, 500 souls. was until uh, November. I chose not to run again. So that's a nutshell. I, I've got a lot of financial planning and financial experience to bring to this, but it's a new committee to me, and I look forward to serving. Representative, is it Malloy? Malloy. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am thrilled to be in this spacious room with a good sound system that uh, we instituted last term, and it's, uh, it's great. Uh, it's a nice way to start, as opposed to two years ago, where we were spread out all over the place and doing video conferencing, so it's nice to, nice to start here, start out, I wanted to say that. Uh, this is my fifth term, uh, and uh, my fourth uh, term here in Ways and Means, uh, I was first elected in 2012 from Barrington, and I served on municipal and county government. I am now in Greenland, so the, t the district is Greenland and Rye, Rockingham 24. My background is in fundraising. I was the chief fundraiser for Iowa Public Television for 15 years and uh, the chief fundraising officer for New Hampshire Public Television for 10 years. So I was responsible for raising all the private money that came into two, those two multi-million dollar uh, organizations for public television. Uh, today, I am uh, serving as a uh, on the Granite State uh, Y Board of Trustees, former chair of the Seacoast YMCA Advisory Committee, and a number num a number of other nonprofits. Uh, and they tap me to say, "Come on in and help us raise some more money." So that's been my uh, my background. I'm also, uh, I was a selectman in Barrington in 2012 in that era, and I still serve on trustee of trust funds in Greenland. And that is my uh, background. Thank you. Thank you very much. Representative, Bo is it Baldwin? Baldwin. Thank you. Sorry. Got it. Thank you, Ms. Um, I'm Bill Bolton, Plymouth. And I joined Sally Fellows as two parts of a 
September um, Grafton 8 contingent. Uh, it was the first time I got elected to uh, the House, my first on. And I'm a former state employee. I, I had 30 years um, with both public health and secretary of state's office. And I became ultimately the director of the Division of Vital Records Administration and saw that budget and the staff as we moved um, archives built. Street. Be Fruit Street, now it's uh, Election Ave or something like that. Or um, Anyway, I, I retired um, in 2008. I became an at home implementation man software that um, basically had to be installed in all 50 states and seven jurisdictions to be able to share vital records uh, data in each other also the National Centers for Health Statistics. So I had my own small business at the time, and uh, two years ago, I much uh, pulled the plug on that. And in the, in the interim, I, I started working as a um, board member, uh, ran for the select board in Plymouth, and um, got elected as my fourth term. And the, the deal with Plymouth is, um, yeah, we, we uh, deal with a um, rather frugal budget, have a elementary school, a regional high school, and a university. And just about 60% of our properties are owned by nonprofits. And uh, property tax is obviously a great concern for Plymouth because here we go up at least a buck, or it might be even four. So I, I'm very lucky to be uh, placed on, on this committee just to follow taxes. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. This is just an opening introduction. There'll be plenty more time, hopefully, to get to know each other on a, on a deeper level. But Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Welcome to the Ways and Means, or welcome back. Uh, my name is Terry Spilsbury. You'll see me on all the lists as Walter, but please address me as Terry, my Nick. Uh, I grew up on Long Island, and uh, found my way to northern New England, going to college in Maine at Bowdoin, um, and uh, was determined I would eventually get back here, but I went hither, thither, and yon in between. I went through law school, and uh, funny enough, I enjoyed tax policy enough that I took three courses in tax in my law school degree. Uh, went on and at later got a, uh, an MBA from Columbia. Um, I was maritime counsel in the U.S. Senate for several years and uh, got heavily into the side of law that most lawyers don't get into, and that is drafting legislative language. <laughs> uh, so so the tax policy and legislative language are things that are near and dear to me. <laughs> uh, this is my second term uh, in the House and turning to ways and means second term. And uh, I'll just say that uh, I've been very pleased to be on Ways and Means because I think it stands out as a committee that's very collegial. And uh, it's remarkable what a high percentage of the bills we report out go onto the consent calendar. Um, and uh, I find that even in those uh, situations uh, uh, where there's a divided opinion, it's, uh, it's a very substantive and respectful uh, discussion. So. Um, I think that makes it an extremely satisfying committee to serve on. Just sort of a preview for those who are joining the committee for the first time. It makes it a very enjoyable committee. I agree. Representative Doucette. Good morning, all. It's good to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, I'm Fred Doucette. I'm serving my fifth term from the town of Salem. Very much looking forward to what the dynamics might be under the circumstances we all find one another under with this evenly divided house and evenly divided committee uh, makeup. Um, just real brief, because I like to pride myself on brevity, and I think uh, Chairman Almy will remember I, I speak often about having two ears and one mouth for a reason. Uh, I'm a lifelong public servant. I served the United States Navy as a corpsman, 
Uh, upon my uh, honorable discharge, I served 25 years as a professional firefighter paramedic in the town of Salem. And subsequent to that, I've been retired, let's see, the end of this month, it'll be 12 years. And like I said, I'm in my fifth term, and I pridefully uh, serve the citizens of New Hampshire and the citizens of my town of Salem. And I very much look forward to getting to know each and every one of you and getting some business done for the people who put us here. Thank you. Representative Leapley. Hi, I'm Nicole Leapley. Uh, my first year here, Concord, I'm excited to be, excited to be on this committee. Um, I love learning new things and challenge. And I love a challenge, so I'm up for it. Um, I spent 20 years in higher ed, have a doctorate from the University of Literature. So I was a professor 2018, just recently at St. Ansel. I grew up in Nebraska, um, came out here for a job at St. A. And my husband is a small business owner. I have two school age kids, so very interested in tax policy. I'm in my second term on the Manchester School Board, uh, so also interested in that perspective. I'm the president of my condo association. Um, so also interested from that perspective, and I look forward to assuming lots of information to get up to speed. Thank you. Representative Sochi. Hi, uh, my name is um, glad to hear that. Uh, Partisan type committee as I would education chair. We can. Oh. Could you yeah. I'm glad to hear that uh, Ways and Means is a more bipartisan approach education, and that was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, my background is um, I have a degree in philosophy, and I worked my way to construction. I took a short, uh, worked as a probation officer for years. And then I decided to make some money and got into real estate. <laughs> now I own and manage my own real estate, so I have my own business. And I figure that would uh, translate well over here in uh, Ways and Means. For now, anyway. Representative Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Amy Jeff Smith. I represent Dover. Uh, this is my first term, so definitely also learning as we go. Um, Ways and Means is certainly not my choice, but I do think I'm a good fit for it. I actually have a master's degree in data analytics from Southern New Hampshire. Um, so I'm used to looking at numbers. Um, I do forecast modeling for my position for staffing. Uh, so predictive modeling, numbers, um, spreadsheets are definitely where I have a lot of background in. Um, I'm a father of three. I have three children, including a toddler. So I am uh, probably younger than most here, and I'm definitely juggling my time between work, family, and Looking forward to doing the work for the people of New Hampshire. Uh, I have a background in public service. Um, I actually did a couple of years of service in AmeriCorps. Um, one of them actually here at the Department of Education, sustainability work for after school programs. Um, so state work, um, public work, and certainly numbers are a thing that I really appreciate. So I'm looking forward to working with everybody. Thank you. Uh, Representative Elberger. Uh, my name is Susan Elberger. I'm a second-generation American, born and raised in Manhattan, didn't own my own home until I was 36 years old, so a, a somewhat different experience from many of you. Uh, I have a master's in counseling and spent a good number of years working in addiction treatment, including uh, as the executive director of a small nonprofit where budgeting was fun, but I turned around a deficit to a profit in my first year, which I was very pleased about. Um, I served on the school committee in Lexington, Massachusetts for six years. As part of that, uh, I was part of a group that was trained by the Harvard Negotiation Project and Principled Negotiations, which uh, I really enjoyed and hope to sort of work on with myself and potentially with others while I'm here. Um, I also served in town meeting as an elected member, both in Lexington and then in Arlington, Massachusetts. Um, 
I've been a contradance caller for more than 40 years. If any of you have any idea what that means, I'd be happy to talk with you about it more. And I'm looking forward to collaborating with you all. And last but not least, I hope I don't mispronounce your last name, Representative Ores. Ores. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is my first term. I've been in an accountant, auditor, senior analyst, controller, VP of finance. Really not good with numbers. Uh, let's see, that was a joke. So let's see. I've helped start two businesses. My wife had a photography business, and then I was a consultant, or as some of my coworkers said, I was an insultant for Johnson & Johnson Healthcare. I retired, I taught high school for five years. I taught accounting at a community college for two years. And my wife, Rosemary, and I have four children and four grandchildren, so I'm on the other. And uh, my kids have turned out to be attorneys and nuclear engineers and that kind of thing. So as far as the attorneys go, I'm not sure where we went wrong, but we're working on that. Uh, let's see. I know when I die, I'm going to heaven, because I've already been in the Army of Fort Evans. Uh, I was happily retired until Dan McGuire, who lives close to me, grabbed my ear and talked me into doing this. And uh, knowing Dan, I know, of course, Carol McGuire put me in touch with that gentleman over there, Uri. Oh, no, it's all Uri. And uh, here I am, folks. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, there we go. Uh, so I thought now we could go over kind of what some of the procedures are on the committee and some of the expectations and talk through some of the scheduling that we have to worry about. Uh, we do want to make sure that this is a very respectful committee uh, and that we are very orderly and fair in how we do things. Did every one of you attend a freshman orientation? Did you get a chance to? You did not. So there will be some procedures that we might have to pull you aside and just help you through a little bit. But do you remember the pink cards? Remember that as part of your training? So anyone who comes to testify on a bill will have to fill out one of those cards. And they will all be sent to me. And we'll try to be very fair about making sure everyone gets heard. And a reminder on the public hearings is that we are here to listen. When we have a public hearing on a bill, we first hear from the sponsors why they're sponsoring the bill. Uh, and then we hear from the public. And our job during the public hearing is not to argue or to debate. Our job is to listen. So I'm going to be pretty strict about that. Um, you will ask all of your check questions for the testifiers through the chair. And um, we want those questions to be actual clarifying questions and not debate. Uh, we're not here to question them their, on their logic. <laughs> we are here to further understand why they are supporting this bill. When it's the executive session, so later on in the process, is when you'll have a time to say your piece and when you might be prepared to make a statement. Does anybody have any questions about the distinction there? Yes. So I just have a uh, question about your statement that you make questions to the chair, because I'm new to that. I know okay. that in EDNA, you know, we asked permission to ask a question, but we didn't have to say what the question was ahead yes, of Yes, that's exactly the same. Yes, all you just, same. but oh. so we don't have 20 of us trying to ask questions all at the same time. You just go through the chair, and we'll, I'll try to keep notes, and he'll keep me on top of things. Um, to make sure we, we recognize everyone. But I just wanted to make sure that we don't have a situation where we find ourselves debating with a presenter, because that's really not our place. Our, our place in a hearing is to listen to the public. And in, in our case, we might also be listening from experts, from agencies, and so forth. I just want to be clear about that. Any other questions on that process? There will also be a blue sheet where people can register basically their thoughts, whether they are for the bill or against the bill. And for folks that want to testify who cannot be here, there is a portal uh, that Legislative Services has that they can submit. And of course, everyone will have access to our email addresses, so you'll be 
inundated with emails from time to time, so people educating the, you on their views on the bill. Okay? We, yes. Sorry, I forgot about that. On, are we, oh dear, I'm sorry. That's okay. Something along, along this line of, uh, That's okay. We have plenty of time to just discuss one. this. Yes, yeah. Representative Southworth. Just to double check, um, my understanding is this term, um, executive sessions are going to be more planned ahead. We had kind of random ones before that could just happen any time. So that, if they do it, it's a big change. We're going to try to be as planful, as predictable as humanly possible. One thing I just want you to be aware of, and I'm sure uh, Representative Almy is aware of this, sometimes we overschedule time for a hearing, and then we find out that we only needed five minutes and we have an hour block of time. In a case like that, if we've already mentioned that there might be an executive session that day, we might think it's a good time to, to exec some bills. So we could open up an executive session. It would be more of a time management thing than anything, but of course I'll consult with the ranking member on that to see, does that make sense? To, should we try to get that done today? Especially on the less controversial bills. We'll use it as a time management tool. Representative Almy? Yes, there, we'd been told that we shouldn't do this. We're sure that everyone on the committee is... We do have a lot of new people. We don't have very many bills. We've got a lot of revenue. Uh, at least until the second committee bill. Right. Well, and that's something I wanted to talk to you a little bit briefly about. According to Ann Fitzgerald, I don't know if you've met her, she runs the committee services department. And she gave me an indication that she thought we'd have about 22 bills coming to this committee, which is actually quite low. We share this room with the Criminal Justice Committee. They think they're going to have 80 bills. So <laughs> we are sharing this room with them. I've, talking, I've talked to the chair. And we've agreed that Ways and Means will have this room Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They will have it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, obviously using Wednesday as a wiggle room day. We only have about nine bills in our possession, so there's only so much we can do right now. And, and just so you know, the revenue estimating usually doesn't start until sometime in February, partly because a lot of the agencies are very busy working with the governor right now on his budget. So they'll, only, they'll have some availability, but they may not be able to give us all the numbers quite yet. However, I would love to start some agency presentations and any other presentations. I've heard of a couple ideas already that we can get early on to educate ourselves so that we're ready. And we might do some bill hearings early on just to get them going. Um, we probably won't have any executive sessions for quite a while because we have a lot of other work to do. Um, and we'll go through that in a little bit more detail, but you know, I don't want to get too far behind, so I'll start scheduling some stuff soon, like for next week. But just for planning purposes, next week, I do not believe we'll be here Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, that criminal justice will be in this room we may be here Monday and Tuesday, depending on what we can schedule that soon. So for planning purposes, I hope that helps. Someone asked me, you know, looking ahead, when do I make my doctor's appointments? I think Thursday and Friday are fairly safe in January. Um, obviously, Thursday is going to be important for session days, but I don't see us having a session day in January, or at least not to the very end, because none of the bills have exec, none of the hear, uh, hearings have gone through, so we don't have any exec sessions, so we have nothing to go to the House session. So that's for planning purposes. I think Thursday, Fridays are pretty open right now. Okay? Madam Chair? Yes. I know I mentioned uh, during our phone that uh, I am on the.
We do not want you to get <laughs> kicked off. It, we'll try to be reasonable as best we can, but we do have deadlines, so I want to go over that a little bit, so thank you for the cue. Um, we are here to do good work, but I don't want to exhaust you. <laughs> we'll try to get full days in so that when you come here, you know, you're here from, let's say, 9 till 4, try to fill in a full day. Uh, obviously with a lunch break as much as we can. I will work with Representative Almy to try to determine how long we think these hearings might be so we can plan our time well uh, and so that we're not super surprised. A lot of the bills that we will hear will not be going to Reps Hall because most people don't care. <laughs> um, you know, we'll be able to stay in this room for a lot of it. We'll be able to plan a lot of this, okay? It, go ahead, yes? Oh, Representative. Thank you. Uh, one category of bills that uh, uh, requires earlier attention, second committee, bills that have to go to a second committee. Yes. I've always found it a little bit, it's unclear which bills are second committee bills. Uh, so, A, uh, do you know, God, in the way of, we've only got a um, that really ups the ante. You got to get get those things, get them moving more. So maybe you could talk to them. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, I don't know of those yet. The only indication we have is what when we see it listed under Ways and Means, what the deadline is. That's the only indication that we know because not all bills that have a fiscal note require a second committee. Yeah. That, I believe, is determined by the Speaker's office, and he works in concert with the House clerk. And I don't have any advance notice on that beyond what you see on the General Court website as well. Right now, I haven't seen any indicated as second committee bills, but absolutely, those will be, as soon as we see those, we should schedule those and get those moving. We also are a second committee for other committees. So if something first goes to criminal justice, let's say marijuana p policy, it would then potentially come to us for the tax side of things. So we'll end up with some more bills that we don't know about yet if they pass through the first committee. Representative Almy? Thank you. Um, I've got, as of last night, 11 bills. Great. And that includes one on moving all sole, sole proprietors tax and sponsored <laughs> okay great uh, well we'll see if we can I, what I guess I'm thinking is if we can schedule some bill hearings next week Monday Tuesday and maybe a pre presentation or two so we'll, we'll mix them up a little bit we get a little bit of both but I don't want to get I think it's hard and you'll start to see this tomorrow when we start to do back-to-back -back presentations for eight hours straight can be a little bit overwhelming. So <laughs> we'll try to break those up going forward. Now, so for the next two days, these are the economic briefings we do together with the Senate Ways and Means Committee to kind of kick off the year. These should be at a very kind of high macro level. In, you know, high level thinking about what is happening in our agencies, what they see coming down the pike. Um, you know, nothing, just really to give us an overall indication of where they think the economy is going. So we'll hear from the inside experts and then we'll hear from the outside experts to get us started. And then we're gonna, we'll keep drilling down into more and more detail and you will have plenty of spreadsheets to look at. Um, do not feel like you have to memorize anything, you know, really just absorb, try to absorb as much as you can, just ask questions, get more and more comfortable as we do the deeper and deeper dive. We won't actually put pen to paper on the revenue estimates for probably six weeks. So we've got time to be learning and thinking and asking good questions. And like I said, if there's something that we're not, you're not getting enough information on and you want more information on, we'll get a presenter to come in. Or as I mentioned, Jennifer, our researcher, can help us understand the history behind some things as well. She has really good access to, well, what are other states are doing? What has been the impact 
you know, all that kind of stuff. She'll be able to help us with that. So any of those requests, send my way, and we'll do the best we can. A okay. couple little decorum things. Um, water is totally acceptable on the table, but really nothing else, if you don't mind. Um, the, you know, when it comes to uh, using your phone, you know, obviously turn off the ringer. Um, laptops, we don't, I don't mind if you have them on the table, and I don't mind if you use them, because let's say a topic comes up and you want to do a little bit of research, you want to read the bill a little bit, or you want to look at something, that's absolutely fine. But what we don't want really in a public hearing is to have you glued to your laptop and not listening to the public. Right, because that would be disrespectful, and we want to make sure people feel welcome, and we appreciate their time. Yes. One exception, hopefully. What's that? I've got to type the stuff up. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, speaking of which, uh, <laughs> so uh, Representative Platt has volunteered to be our committee clerk. Thank you. <laughs> That is awesome, because <laughs> usually the chair has to go find someone to do that. It is a lot of work, and uh, we really appreciate that, because he's going to be taking notes for all of us, for the record, and uh, we appreciate that. He will also be calling the roll when it comes time to take a vote during executive session. Any questions so far? All right, deadlines. So now for the freshmen, this is your Bible right here. Make sure you have your calendar and you're looking at it constantly. Jennifer and I will do our best to communicate with you via emails, but please keep checking these because we don't want to miss something. The deadlines are right up front, page two, and this is what we're held to. So this is what we always have to be paying attention to, and I appreciate your reminding me if we get close to deadline and we haven't done something. Uh, so, very importantly, Thursday, February 16th, is the last day to report House bills going to a second committee. So, no later than that, any of the bills that are marked as a second committee bill have to have been exact from this committee. I would strongly prefer not to get backed up uh, tight against any deadlines. I'd like to have a little wiggle room. So, we're gonna, that's what we're going to strive to do as soon as we have the bills. We're going to do the best we can. Yes. Just ask if there could on my out for I was already talking about on one that is in our committee problem somebody looks at a municipal property on bill and thinks, oh, that's the tax but actually they take did not property at the and on, but there are also bills that end up in a that okay well, <laughs> I appreciate your, all of your eagle eyes if you see anything like that so just for the freshman's sake usually if a bill has a an impact on the budget or it has an impact on taxes or revenue there would be two committees involved one would be the policy committee the underlying policy and then the second one would be us if it had to do with a tax or a fee or revenue impact make sense so there are certain ones that will come to us only because we deal with that policy. For example, cigars and cigarettes. <laughs> Believe it or not, all comes to us, I believe. I don't think it ever goes to commerce. Um, and we have to deal with that. Sometimes. If, it, if it's not to do with the money. Um, I once ended up with a bill about um, putting the tobacco products that were attractive to children behind the counter and it went to commerce interesting well so it, and the house clerk really reads through all the bills and tries to send them to the right committee and they do a really exhaustive read to you know look at the rsas that are being impacted and they do the best job they can but we, we might have to give them some feedback along the way if we see something go awry so 
And there is one other, there are two other objectives in our uh, committee description. One of them is to look out for the treasury of the state, which is very broad. And the other one is dedicated funds, which historically ended up here because I st was the one that started doing dedicated funds 26 years ago, I think it is now. And, um, and that doesn't make as much sense to people sometimes as if it's about uh, nursing dedicated fund. It, they think it should go over to Health and Human Services or something like that. Sometimes bills that make more sense in the financial terms to come here end up over there because they are awfully busy when they're trying to assign these bills, as you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, they they can't know everything either. So. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. We'll go over that in more detail. Don't worry about that yet. But sometimes we have all this revenue coming in. We think, ah, we get plenty of money. And then we realize, well, it's been dedicated to something else. So you'll learn more about that. Representative Janigan, did you have something? Oh, Ullery. Thank you, Representative Ullery. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lori. <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair, um, you talked about uh, receiving emails, and I just wanted, for the benefit of the freshmen, if it's a bill about speeding on Lake Winnipesaukee, you can expect you know, four to 5,000 emails. Uh, and I don't think there's any obligation to save those from out of state. Uh, you can, that's what the delete button is for. Just the back of your mind. Other emails that come to your legislative email account are open to public uh, records request. Uh, if they go to the led.ledge email, they are saved here. But if you have a private one that goes through the dot .ledge one, they may or may not be. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, as a legislator, anything that does with legislation is open to public records, uh, our public records law. So if you have a separate account for legislative activities maintain that just so you don't get in trouble with that on on the ethics side uh, just to, uh, something to remember uh, you were talking about dedicated funds uh, and you're going to explain that later that there are two types of dedicated funds and fund funds and how they operate and in that so we'll have a, a deeper discussion of that it has generally if I'm not stepping out of line been the policy of this committee to uh, look askance at dedicated funds um, that for a variety of reasons. Some are very necessary. There's no question about it. Uh, Representative Almy and former Representative uh, Major spent uh, a lot of time taking a look at various dedicated funds to figure out which ones should and which ones shouldn't. We had several dedicated funds, a couple of which were non-lapsing. They just had this huge amount of money that was doing nothing. And if, if we're going to collect a tax, the tax has got to do something, which is something I, if I'm not mistaken, not speaking out of term, it's something we need to take a look at a tax. Does it do anything? And if it does something, well, then the policy decision comes up from that. Um, and you're also going to, uh, I would suggest that we uh, have somebody run over this for the freshmen so that we can uh, understand what uh, your monthly revenue focus is. You should be on the email list now, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. You'll be getting a daily uh, revenue uh, statement as to how much money is coming in. But how much money is coming in doesn't really mean anything because it's how much money is going out when, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And that, that becomes more clear when, when you read this. Yeah, so you, were, you received this email over the weekend. Actually, Chris Shea was very busy. Uh, the State of New Hampshire Monthly Revenue Focus, this is actually produced by the Department of Administrative Services, but incorporates, obviously, information from the DRA and other agencies. It's a wonderful read, and there's beautiful graphs. 
usually in color, which really is nice. So this is a, a real go-to. I've been receiving this for 12 years. I love it. Um, and it, we will have someone hopefully go over this in more detail very soon. We'll do a deeper dive on this for you so you can ask questions. Okay. Awesome. Representative Almi? Yes. Do I have permission to give a counter view to this idea that that attacks may not do something? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Attack. to be controversial. Attacks <laughs> goes into the general fund or the education trust fund or some other major fund on a fee. Actually, those are the only two, I okay, think. I, yeah. And a fee can easily be set up that on sometimes goes elsewhere than where it was supposed to go. Uh, and I have been fighting on the dedicated fund committee for quite a while now since we got our new comptroller who thinks that that's okay as long as the legislature wrote it into the law. Uh, <laughs> All I, right, I, to I, be I, continued at another date, please. <laughs> but I don't disagree. It is complicated. Representative Fellows. <laughs> well, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to ask if maybe you could take it up with a um, speaker or somebody that at some point, not right away, if there were some training related to emails in the, the legislative um, the legislative emails because some what I've been able to do is I identify I put I made rules. So I identified certain recipients certain people who are sending me an email. I those automatically get forwarded to my home account. And then there are some emails that I make go to a special folder because they're from the committee chair. And, and there are other things that you could do. But I, I just think that it would be useful for people, not right, not this week, you know, but when they start to get into it, there are a lot of things that you can do with, with that legislative email account. Okay, Representative Ellery? Downstairs in legislative research, this gentleman, uh, Rich, what's his name? Uh, say again? Lambert. Lambert, Rich Lambert. I, the name just skipped me. Uh, just go ahead and ask those questions directly of him. He's on the ethics, uh, Joint Legislative Ethics Committee. He's the uh, staff person for them, and he will answer any questions you have gladly. Rich Lambert, downstairs, legislative research. It's over in the uh, executive office building, second floor. Almost directly. Is that in the OLS office? It's attached to OLS. It's right beside them. You go in the far, uh, the northernmost door, the governor's door, if you will. You go to the first hallway, take a right, take a right into the first, and you're right there. Uh, but to your point, Representative Fellows, if I hear that there's a general need for more training or more services or more anything, I will certainly speak to the speaker about that for you. Representative Rushford. Um, thank you. This is probably an elementary question, but just something I, in, in, if we need to talk about this offline, I'm fine with that. But um, how does the Ways and Means Committee, obviously we're looking at revenue and the money that's coming in to the Treasury and the, 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 what, what we're collecting. Uh, that's vital to the budget writers because they have to know how much they're working with. How do we work with, is there a relationship that we have with finance, the finance committee? Uh, do we communicate that with them? How, uh, what, what is our, is there a working relationship with our committee and, and those folks? Yes and no. We have very separate jobs. Uh, we provide the revenue estimates and what we'll do once we we're going to drill down we're going to take little minor votes all along the way first we'll start with some straw votes see where we're at then we'll get more specific then we'll get more serious and then we'll come up with a final final resolution and we will present a house resolution hopefully it's bipartisan unanimous on what we believe our revenue estimates are and then that that's what they will use now saying that um, this is something that will be evolving I believe especially given the circumstances that we're under and the fact that we will have to produce those numbers before we have very important data from DRA on business tax receipts in April. So we'll have to give it to them, but we might need to revise those numbers as we know more. But that is our job, is to provide that information to finance, and then they decide how to spend it. Go ahead. Uh, did anyone have something else over here? Questions? Yes, go ahead. Representative Platt, yes. 
Um, we have some bills in front of us already to cut this tax or that tax. Mm -hmm. That's great. I like cutting taxes. But without the revenue impact and how it affects the overall uh, revenue stream, I, I, it, I, I find it hard to make a decision w without putting a bigger picture around it. How do we get that? We will request, well, well, first of all, we'll have a fiscal impact statement. So we will hear from DRA their best guess in a static situation of what that impact will be. And then, of course, we will hear, you know, I know there's some lobbyists here from some of the industry folks. Hopefully they will present to us when a tax cut bill or tax increase bill comes in, they will let us know what they think the impact will be. And then we're going to have to bring our life experiences in and figure it out <laughs> and make our best decision. But we're a long way off from that. We'll also invite our researcher, maybe outside organizations to weigh in, give us their thoughts on what it all means. We'll have to find out. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, take a look, for instance, at HB 100. Fiscal note is on the back. This is very frustrating, but this is what we get these days. The first thing is a chart that says, we have no idea what this is going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then it provides an analysis how they got to trying to get some idea of what it might do. And then this year, for the first time, on they are giving us on the back of that first page of the fiscal note on impact through to FY28. We never had anything but the existing, and it doesn't even, if I remember, if I think, you know, it doesn't even have on the prior year to take a look at, which makes things a little difficult in some cases. On, but this is really important for us because we've passed a lot of bills that say, in this year it's going to do this, in that year it's going to do that, the other, the third year it's going to kill the tax altogether. Uh, and the third year is outside of the purview of the previous fiscal notes. But um, it, does, it is, does take a fair amount of reading. And then there is Representative Olery's unfavorite most point on table two, static analysis. I actually would like to tell Representative Olery that I had a minor concussion in the fall and I forgot to put in the bill that was actually going to start us towards a place where maybe we could do some non-static analysis. Uh, but uh, next year, it will be here. <laughs> So, um, but static analysis is all that we can really expect out of the Department of Revenue Administration. They want to cleave as closely as possible to facts. What that means, though, is that they frequently give us analysis based on two years prior when the audits are finished. Uh, and then they try to, think, to uh, estimate where we ought to be today based on that one. And then they have to try to just continue to estimate on that basis So for the future. When you've got something that might be a recession coming up, or you might already be in a little sludge of a recession in some industries, that can be important. And so this is going to be our job to try to figure out how to interpret those. But I think it would be really helpful. Unfortunately, the person who needs to do it was here this morning. Uh, he can very, does a very good job of taking us through these, as does the Commissioner of Revenue Administration. Yes, thank you, Representative Almy. And uh, Representative Ollery, you're next. But I just want to mention, I've already met with the Commissioner of DRA and asked her to come see us soon and more often than ever before and, and her team to help us really drill down on all of this uh, and she has agreed to do so so representative Ullery you know the, the commissioner has a the commissioner has a great deal of experience having basically done it from the ground up 
uh, from staff level to rising to being in charge of everything. So she, she has a pretty good grasp of thing. I thank uh, the representative from Lebanon regarding the uh, uh, static analysis. Uh, just uh, to clarify the terminology, static means you've got this figure, you've got this figure, you subtract or add them together to come up with something. But you, the only figure you know you have is, as Representative Almy said, two years old. So you're not doing anything current. And the state has not seen fit to rent Watson for a couple of days, which would cost more than our budget. Uh, but it would be nice if we had access to Watson to plan that out. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing your bill because that, uh, that's one of the things that we have to do is guesstimate. And our guesstimation is going to be difficult in this environment with a large amount of money floating around doing something. And uh, further, if I could, thank you regarding the fees. Taxes and fees are two separate things. Fees do something. Taxes or taxes are just revenue generators. But thank you for that definition, and I don't necessarily disagree with your point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And back to deadlines uh, and scheduling. I think we'll start a little bit on the slower side, but plan it to ramp up as we're getting to the later part of January into February. But we're going to be busy in the House in general through April 6th, which is crossover. Okay, so keep that in mind. Try not to plan any vacations until after that, <laughs> please. We're going to need you here. Um, I know that's tough. It's a long haul. We tend to generate a lot more bills in the House than the Senate does. Go figure. Uh, so the, right after crossover, we get a little reprieve because we have less Senate bills coming over, right? So that's, that's when you can kind of plan on a little bit of a deep breath, but it's going to ramp. It's going to get busier and busier because this is a budget year. So expect it to be busy in March. Okay? Questions on that? Awesome. All right, what else do I have? Oh, we've had, uh, there's a chance that we could also do field trips. I'll have to spark up my laptop for that. But we had one lobbyist for a company request uh, or offer that we could go visit a company and learn more about the industry. Uh, give me a moment and see if I can find it. Um, this had to do, I think, with tobacco. Let me see if I can find Is it. Is the warehouse? Some warehouse in Kentucky. Does yeah. that sound familiar? We went there years ago. Okay. Um, so now those are, you know, you don't have to go. You, but it, it will help instruct you when we start to see bills about that. I personally haven't seen any bills on that topic yet, but there may be some. Um, apologize. Let me see if my, I can connect to the Internet here. McLean, does that sound familiar? Yes. Uh, McLean is a distributor of many items sold in convenience stores. This includes tobacco, and they would like to invite us to do a tour of their facility. I believe members would benefit from seeing how tobacco taxes are collected for the state, as well as a firsthand look at a major distributor involved in the supply chain. Supply chain. So Kentucky is a suburb, basically, of Concord. Uh, it's only. 10, 15 minute drive. So it wouldn't be, I, I don't think it would be too burdensome for you. Uh, what do you think, what do you guys think? Interested? Yes? Could be fun? Okay. How much, how much can we carry out and sell on the <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, If you haven't been involved in that whole world, it is eye-opening and something I don't know a lot about. Um, so I'm open to scheduling it, and then you can certainly, if it's something you want to do, great. If not, no big deal. Representative Platt. I think fairly early on, because then we could hit the gr ground smoking. <laughs> <laughs> is this dad jokes? <laughs> um, another thing to mention for scheduling is sometimes we will have a hearing, and then we won't do anything about it to exec session because it's not complicated, easy. Other times, especially when it comes to the revenue stuff, we will do subcommittees of the committee as a whole. 
So we'll do the initial public hearing, and then we'll come back and do a subcommittee of the whole to really work through the numbers. Okay, so we're a little different from some other committees, which would break out into, like Commerce, for example, breaks out into different three different divisions, and they do subcommittees on just about everything. Here, we'll do more subcommittees of the whole, unless it's a very minute topic, and we can get three or four people to just drill down on that issue. Okay? Yes, Representative Apes. Yeah. On that last point, it wasn't what I put my hand up for, but... Uh, We've done it both ways. There, we've definitely done subcommittees in the sense of a smaller group to focus on this, that, or the other thing that seemed to be amenable to maybe constructive work by a smaller group. And uh, that's worked well. And then we've done it in those committees of the whole. Uh, so, you know, whatever seems to fit. Uh, I just wanted to mention two other th categories. One is, uh, there's, I don't think this has been mentioned, but maybe it has, but we've got the monthly revenue focus. We've talked about that. There have been, t there are two other sources of data, of uh, revenue data um, that I receive, and I think most people on Ways and Means bef from before receive. I just, I just wanna be sure, maybe Jen knows, that uh, everybody's gonna get this stuff. Uh, one is from the DRA. And it starts in the middle of the month. And it, it's a, a more detailed source of information about the revenue from the business tax, for example, that there are estimated taxes that have come in. And they're at this level. And you can see the last year, the last year and the, last, uh, the previous month and so forth. There are refunds that have been paid. You get a sense of what's happening on the refunds. You could start, start to drill into what's happening with the business taxes. It's a very good source document. And uh, so I just want to be sure, maybe you're, you've set it up, or maybe Jen has, or maybe it's automatic, I don't know. But uh, in past years, it wasn't. Uh, so let's make sure that everybody gets that. And then Chris uh, has uh, his own uh, a daily presentation of aggregate revenues that he starts sending about, out about the middle of the month from LBAO. Um, and that's just another way of checking on what's happening. Very useful. So I, I just want to make sure that that stuff gets out. Absolutely. I agree. I I believe I mentioned that to the DRA commissioner already, but I will make sure, maybe Jennifer can help follow up with that, that we want both of those two regular emails to go to every member of this committee. Right. Do you know what we're talking about? Double check, yeah. It yeah. is very, very valuable, I agree. That's Did you have something else? Uh, sorry, yeah. Representative oh. Ames, why don't you go ahead and finish? Well, it's a different, different category, but uh, I, I don't think uh, this was mentioned, but I could have been daydreaming. Um, and that was uh, the gambling side of things. We we have a a policy and revenue responsibility for all the gambling uh, activities that are allowed in New, in New Hampshire, and uh, and that has taken up a lot of time, our time in the past. We we're the only committee that understands these issues. So I just wanted to mention that, and we may be consumed by it uh, here now. On the, you know, as, as uh, issues erupt uh, in that arena, they come to us. I just wanted to mention that. Representative Ames, did you have something else to add? No. Okay, and Almy. <laughs> Representative Almy, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say that that uh, those documents that come, especially the one from the DRA that comes out every day from the middle of the month, on um, you can get obsessed by those numbers. On um, you may get really upset on Tuesday that we're way behind, and then on Wednesday they've made up a gap and we're ahead. On um, but 
what really matters is the final day of the month because that's the one that he's talking about where you get the refunds, you get the, um, the uh, tax the payments estimates. and the estimates, the tax payments are on after you get sent a letter and told you didn't pay this tax or part of this tax. Um, so on, it's the last day of that when you get these huge charts and they're a little hard to print out, which is a problem. I did get them to start designing them so that they would go on a legal piece of paper but if you make them any smaller, then you can't really see what you've printed out. <laughs> so, on. Um, and then, uh, I don't remember things very well without writing them down anymore. So, I don't remember what the one on the other one That's was. okay. We've got plenty of time. Right. And just don't panic, guys. <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of information coming at you. You do not need to memorize it or anything like that. Look for trends. Just look for understanding where things are going, how they come in, but uh, don't get too worried. Uh, food is here. But uh, Representative Janigian, did you have something? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add something very quickly. I know when I first started looking at those daily revenues and it would say, you know, maybe it's the 20th of the month and you'd look at it and it would say, you know, revenues are 20 million below just realize that when you look at the next day and more comes in, that number is going to go down. And typically, or what we've been seeing lately is by the end of the month, we've actually been running a surplus. Now that may not continue, but just realize that number is only as of that particular day. So thank you. This is a great stopping point for lunch, unless anyone had something else to add. And I apologize, I can't see all of you over here on my left. Anything over here to add? OK, great. Let's break. Um, and so lunch will be served in this room. Please stay, enjoy each other's company, get to know each other, and we will reconvene at 1.30 sharp to hear from the CPA Society. Thank you.
Good. Do you want to go ahead and get started? Welcome. Good afternoon. Great. Madam Chairperson, members of the committee, thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you. Can you all hear me well? Great. My name is Robin Abbott. I'm the CEO of the New Hampshire Society of CPAs, and I would like to thank all of you for allowing us to come and give a brief overview of the accounting profession in our state, offered by some of the most educated and successful practitioners that are also members of the society. As a brief overview, we're a statewide nonprofit organization that works to develop and maintain high professional standards and offers a wide array of legislative, technical support, and networking opportunities for its members. Advocacy, educational partnerships, and professional development are what we strive to provide, and being here today aligns perfectly with our goal of helping to understand the complexities which this field is very well known for, as you may all know. We are also very proud of our business partnerships and collaborations, including that of the New Hampshire Bankers, the New Hampshire Bar, and most importantly, the Department of Revenue Administration. We have fostered these relationships and have a wonderful working relationship with all of them, including quarterly meetings with Commissioner Stepp and her team. Today, you will hear from four of our esteemed members, Michelle McVetty, Corey Reynolds, Kevin Kennedy, and Karen LaSalle, who is our board chair at the Society. On your agenda is my contact information, as well as Teresa Rosenberger's, who is our legislative advocate, and helped us schedule today's presentation, and we are grateful to her. Please feel free, after this presentation, to reach out to me directly if there's any follow-up you need, or if you'd like me to reach out to any of the presenters today, and I will make sure that happens. So again, thank you so very much for having us today, and I look forward to you hearing from what we have to say. So I will welcome Michelle McVetty up at this time. So we've done our best to um, summarize this for you, but it's a lot to, lot to put on paper, so. Bring it real close here, okay. <laughs> Hi there, uh, thank you Madam Chair and fellow committee members for having us here today. I'm Michelle McVetty. I am co-chair of the Tax and Legislative Committee of the so New Hampshire Society of CPAs. I am also a licensed CPA and partner at Coos Advisors um, CPA firm in Lancaster, New Hampshire. Um, at Coos Advisors, we specialize in accounting and tax services to New Hampshire and Vermont small businesses ranging from 500,000 in revenue to 5 million in revenue. So my section today um, for the presentation is to provide an overview of the New Hampshire business profits tax, also referred to as BPT. We'll talk very high level um, about what the tax is, who is subject to it, and other facets of the BPT. So what is BPT? BPT is an apportioned net income tax on business activity conducted in New Hampshire at a rate of 7.6% for tax periods ending in 2022 and 7.5% for tax periods in 2023. So that's reducing one tenth of a percent. The tax applies to any, organized, any enterprise organized for gain or profit, carrying on a business activity within the state, except for nonprofits who are exempt from taxation under the Internal Revenue Code. The tax is applied at an entity level for any business at or above $92,000 in gross business income. The filing threshold is a very recent increase from $50,000, which was the filing threshold for 30 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. C and S corporations, partnerships, single member LLCs, sole proprietorships, um, for t federal tax purposes are all New Hampshire taxpayers um, and are subject to the BPT tax. I will also note that there is no requirement that the activity be a trade or business that, as identified under federal income tax purposes and therefore may include residential and commercial re rental real estate activities 
if gross rents or in other income derived from the property exceed 92,000, the filing threshold. So it's usually gross rents or if a taxpayer sells a property and the property um, obviously usually would have a gross proceeds over 92,000 and that would make them subject to the New Hampshire business tax. To calculate the net business income, New Hampshire starts with the federal taxable income of the entity and then makes adjustments to that income based on certain income and deductions that differ in treatment from the IRS. So pursuant to RSA 77A colon one, New Hampshire has adopted the Internal Revenue Code as of a particular date for each taxable year. The current Internal Revenue Code version that is in effect right now is the code as of December 31st, 2018. The version has not changed since the New Hampshire statute changed it as of 1-1-2020 and includes the Significant Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Admin adjustments are necessary to account for the version of the Internal Revenue Code adopted by New Hampshire. The most common adjustments um, that are seen are, one, the amount of Section 179 expense taken on a federal tax return. If it is in excess of the amount allowed by New Hampshire, and which is as of today is $500,000 for, that's again, section 179 expense. Another common adjustment is bonus depreciation um, for assets placed in service during the year. Bonus depreciation is allowed federally under Internal Revenue Code 78K, but is not allowed at all for New Hampshire BPT purposes. And then a th the third common add back is estate income tax based taxes. We we'll also see other adjustments that aren't as common, but so I'll just go over those really quickly. Adjustments for foreign dividends consisting of guilty that were not previously subject to BPT and or foreign dividends consisting of deemed one-time repatriation, repatriation under the TCGA, which is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Kevin will speak more about guilty later in the presentation. Other TCJA-related adjustments are business interests deducted in excess of the federal limitation and charitable deductions in excess of the federal limitation. And then finally, a quite rare um, adjustment is de amounts deducted under the Internal Revenue Code Section 181, which is the treatment of certain qualified film and television and live theatrical productions. So changes in the federal income tax, like what we've seen during the pandemic, often brought state conformity through legislature. For example, the PPP loan forgiveness that was received by most small businesses was not taxable by federal statute resulting from the CARES Act. Because New Hampshire does not have a rolling conformity with the Internal Revenue Code, uh, special legislation was required to make PPP loan forgiveness not taxable to New Hampshire businesses. Another significant adjustment that is quite unique to New Hampshire is relevant for partnerships, single member LLCs, and sole proprietors only, and that is the reasonable compensation deduction. Um, so these businesses can deduct reasonable compensation for personal services performed by a proprietor, partner, or member for the business organization. A proprietor, partner, or single um, member LLC whose owner performs services for the business may take a reasonable compensation deduction um, on the business's BPT returned, return for, the, for those services. There is a safe harbor of $75,000 in the New Hampshire statute where the business does not have to demonstrate whether the deduction is reasonable. To the extent a compensation deduction in exceeds the safe harbor, reasonableness is often demonstrated through um, using Internal Revenue Code Section 162, and from there using a number of authoritative documents related to Section 162 to justify the reasonableness of the deduction. Section 162 addresses deductible expenses for businesses for federal purposes to the extent that expenses are ordinary and necessary for the business organization. If a business was not able to take a reasonable compensation deduction a prior year due to insufficient business profits, 
The business may adjust this year's compensation deduction to reflect the undercompensation in the prior years. The amount of the deduction, however, cannot be reduced below zero. You might ask why the reasonable compensation deduction isn't applicable to C or S corporations, and this is because the owners of these entities are or are likely to be paid through a W-2 wages for the services that they have provided and therefore is already deducted from the gross business income. Partners, members, and proprietors do not receive traditional W-2 wages, and therefore the business expenses do not reflect salaries and wages paid to the owners. Um, next, I'd like to talk about net operating loss deductions, also referred to as NOLs. In brief, net operating losses each year are collected and used against future business profits. A business can carry forward an NOL for a period of 10 years and a maximum of $10 million. This increased from $1 million in 2013. For tax periods ending on or after December 31st, 2022, which is the filing season we are heading into, the deduction for NOL is limited to the less lesser of NOL available or 80% of the current year taxable income for BPT. So for an example, if a business was an, has an NOL available for prior years totaling $100,000 and the current taxable year, current um, year taxable income is $100,000, the NOL available to apply is $80,000, so 80% of the current year income. This leaves $20,000 remaining of taxable income and $20,000 remaining of an NOL carry forward to be used against a future tax year. Um, to close out, I'll just make a brief mention of credits. Um, New Hampshire has several credits that can be used to offset BPT. The most common among businesses is the BET credit, or some say often call it BET credit. The BET credit is generated through um, business enterprise tax paid in the current year and the prior 10 years, as it has a 10-year carry forward. Um, this leaves a perfect segue into the next section of our presentation, as we have Corey Reynolds come up. Um, he's already here. <laughs> Talk to you about the business enterprise tax. Thank you. Excuse me, just one moment. A ton of information. Yes. Fortunately, as a business owner, I have to deal with all of these personally. Can we pause to see if people have questions? Absolutely. Anyone over here have any questions? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a question on, um, could you just explain what bonus depreciation is? Sure. So bonus depreciation is a federal, um, so under 168K, allows a business to basically deduct the entire cost of a asset that's placed in service during the year. So if a business owner bought a tractor, tractor costs $75,000. Under regular depreciation, they would depreciate that tractor typically over a five or seven year period. Bonus depreciation allows them to, al to take it all in one year, the year of service. And so New Hampshire says, nope. And they, so you would have, in that case, practitioners would carry, you can still take it for federal purposes, but New Hampshire would then deduct it over the five or seven year period, depending on the life of the asset. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Yes, Representative Albee. Thank you. Um, many years ago now, we had to deal with uh, the safe harbor and the compensation deduction. And at that time, there were some major abuses going on. I would like to know if um, the small businesses now feel that the, the law is fair and the way it is being applied is fair. Um, speaking from my own experience, it, um, I do think that it had a positive impact on practitioners and business owners being able to substantiate a compensation deduction at 75000 or below. Um, I don't know if anybody, any of my peers behind me would like to comment, but I, yes, I think that it has a general positive effect on that. In the interest of time, I think we want to... We do want to ask some questions, but we don't get too far in the weeds today. We can hopefully always ask you to come back. Absolutely. Okay, yes. great. Is that okay if we do, we, do you have a quick question? Just a quick one. Okay, go ahead. 
like any profession, you have your acronyms. What's TCJA? Yes, TCJA is, stands for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 that the Trump administration passed. Thank you. Please proceed. All right. Thank you, Michelle. So my, my name is Corey Reynolds. I'm here from Baker Newman Noise. I'm a senior manager there. Our firm works from a really mid to large size businesses, goes from you know, mid-sized developers you know, up to multinational operations that do business all over the world. My personal focus tends to be in the world of real estate development and investment. Um, uh, today, I'm here to talk to you about the business enterprise tax, which Michelle did mention. It really is a tax that runs parallel to the business profits tax in many ways. Uh, so the business enterprise tax, commonly referred to as BET or BET, is a 0.55% tax on the total dividends, compensation, and interest expense that's paid by an entity. And we'll go into each of those factors just to provide you a little bit of information. And one key takeaway there is it is a tax based on these amounts paid by the entity. It's not a tax on net income from operations. Um, for 2022, a business is subject to the business enterprise tax if they have gross business receipts of at least $250,000 or they have that an enterprise value base of $250,000. That enterprise value base being the combination of dividends, compensation, and interest. For 2023, that $250,000 threshold is going up to $281,000. Starting through the factors, so first talking about dividends. So dividends are not just what you would consider you know, stock dividends from publicly traded corporations but it's cash distributions from any entity of current or accumulated New Hampshire profits. Um, I think it's easiest to describe that just by providing a brief example of what that would look like. So, you know, say, say year one of operations for business, they have $100,000 of net business profits and no cash is removed from the business. They don't pay anything out to the, the members. Then coming into year two, they have 50, another $50,000 of New Hampshire profits. So at this point, the accumulated New Hampshire profits is 150,000, 100 year one, 50 year two. And then say at the end of year two, they distribute 125,000 to the members. Well, at this point, your accumulated earnings is 150. You took out 125. So that whole 125 was accumulated or current earnings. So that 125 is considered dividends for the purposes of the business enterprise tax. Then at that point, you have 25,000 left of accumulated earnings. So going into year three, what does it look like if we then make a distribution in excess of that amount? So say year three, it's break even, and we make $40,000 in distributions. Well, 25,000 of that is dividends for business enterprise tax to the extent of our accumulated earnings that are left. And the remaining 15 would not be subject to the business enterprise tax. Perhaps it's a return of capital or debt finance return uh, distribution, something along those lines. Moving on to the next factor, compensation. So compensation is a little more straightforward and it will be your W-2 type compensation that you pay to your employees, directors, officers, wh whoever it might be. Um, and then there's a few additions to there over that you know, regular W-2 income subject to withholding. So those common additions would first be the employer contributions to retirement plans. So that's also subject to the business enterprise tax under the compensation factor. And then also, as Michelle mentioned, the compensation deduction. If any compensation deduction is taken on the New Hampshire return, that's also considered compensation for the sake of business enterprise tax. Moving on to the third and final factor here, so interest expense. So interest expense is exactly what you would expect. There's nothing too creative here. It's going to be your interest expense on mortgages, loans, v equipment loans, shareholder loans, whatever it might be, just normal interest expense paid and accrued during the year. Is That's part of that factor. So if someone's subject to the tax, you go through all three of those factors, add them up, apply the 0.55% rate, and then you get your business enterprise tax liability for the year. 
And Kevin will touch a little bit on some of the considerations on a multi-state entity and how that would change the apportionment of how much of your business enterprise tax base is subject to tax within the state. And going hand in hand, which in, we'll, we'll get back to how the business enterprise tax ties in with business profits tax, I'm going to take a quick rundown through a lot of the credits that are available, both with the enterprise tax and with the profits tax. And so first one on the list, R&D tax credit research and development. And go a little bit more into depth on this one just because it, it tends to get a few more questions. And a lot of ways it mirrors the federal tax credit for research and development where you're looking at it, a credit related to the expenses paid for improving business processes, developing products, patents, software, uh, types of items like that. Often companies will hire a third party to come in and take a look at their operations to determine how much of our operations are actually related to R&D type activities. For New Hampshire purposes, they just focus on the wages. So that any wages related to R&D, and there's an application process. So after determining how much in wages related to R&D during the year that they're gonna claim for their federal application, well then they make an application to New Hampshire that says, well here's the amount of wages we had related to R&D and the amount of credit we're applying for, the amount of credit of being 10% of those wages. So if you had $50,000 of R&D wages, you're putting in an application to New Hampshire for $5,000 of credit. What New Hampshire does after you, this application is filed is they only have a set pool of money that they're giving out for the R&D credit. So I believe the number, someone else can correct me if I'm wrong, is about $7 million it is about the total pool of credit that's available. So based on the amount of applications they get, how much credit is applied for, each, per, each entity who applied for an R&D credit will then get a proportional piece of what's available if there's more than $7 million of credit that, would, that were applied for. One, you know, once, after that's been determined, they receive a letter from the New Hampshire DRA just letting them know, here's how much credit you have. You can, you can claim this credit on your tax return and attach this letter saying how much credit that we issued to you. Go, looking at some of the other credits, we're going to move through a lot of these ones pretty quick. So the Coas County credit, which is just related to creating new jobs within Coas County. There's the ERZ credit, which is a credit for capital investment and employee hiring in specific parts of the state. Uh, CDFA credits, uh, uh, community development. Uh, I can't, I also. Finance Authority, Finance Authority, thank you, um, which is a 75% credit for contributions to certain economic uh, projects within the state. Um, education tax credit, this is also a credit based on contributions to certain programs within the state, specifically for uh, qualified scholarship organizations. Insurance premium tax credit, I don't think too many of us here deal with that very often. Uh, it's just related to certain uh, taxes paid by the insurance industry. And then just last one I'll mention real quickly, the CTE centers tax credit or career and technical education centers. This is similar to CDFA or the education credit, a credit to businesses for contributions to those career and technical centers that's used for salaries of apprentices. So, and then moving on to our, our last credit here. So looking at the business enterprise tax credit that can be used against a business profit tax. So tying really these two parallel tax systems together. So e each year, once after that business enterprise tax is determined, any amount of business enterprise tax that's incurred during a year can be used as a credit against any business profits tax that was incurred during the year. If you don't use all of your business enterprise tax credit that's created in a year, that unused amount can carry forward up to 10 years to continue to offset business profits tax in future years. I, again, I, I think it's easiest illustrated by just talking, putting a few quick numbers on it, uh, putting, making an example. So let's say in year one, a taxpayer incurs $50,000 of the enterprise tax and $40,000 of the profits tax. Well, they have, <clears throat> They, they've created $50,000 of business enterprise tax credit because of that $50,000 of enterprise tax. So since they only have $40,000 of business profits tax, 
their portion, their business profits tax is reduced to zero, and then there's ten thousand dollars of enterprise tax left, o enterprise tax credit left over. So they'll have ten thousand dollars of credit carry forward for up to ten years. At the end of that year, really their tax liability, what they're, the cash that they're actually going to pay to the state, is the fifty thousand dollar BET liability. Just that, just the business enterprise tax liability that they incurred. And just an example of what it looks like for the carry forward. So then year two, okay, we incur 50000 in business enterprise tax again, but it's a more profitable year, so we had $90,000 in the profits tax. So our net business profits tax after we apply our enterprise credits is going to be $30,000. As we have the $90,000 of profits tax, we have the $50,000 in current year, BET credits from the BET paid this year and the $10,000 of credit that we carried forward from the prior year. Then our BET, our enterprise tax is still $50,000. So overall, your tax liability, what you're actually paying in cash to the state is that $50,000 of enterprise tax plus your $30,000 of net business profits tax, so a total of $80,000. And that's all, all for me right now. Unless we have any quick questions, I'll, I'll pass it on to Kevin. Representative Ors. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my, the one thing you mentioned about R&D is that the businesses only take salary percentage that's R&D related, or is there more to it? As in, if this building was an R&D center, could they write this off or a percentage of it? So for New Hampshire purposes, all you can claim is the wages. And when you look at the federal level, there's a lot, there's m many more expenses that can, be com that can be claimed, but New Hampshire just focuses on New Hampshire wages related to the R&D that was in including the federal application. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. We will drill down on all of these a little bit more, with, especially with the DRA. So any other quick questions, clarification? Yes, Representative Jingyu. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question on the, the carry forward. The way you described it makes complete sense. My question is, who's, who's tracking it? Are you depending on the, for example, a business has a 10-year carry forward in year one. In year two, there might be more carry forward. In year three, it's reduced. In year four, at some point, how do you know where the 10 years ended for each? Is it up to the business to track that, or are you guys tracking that? that it's work? a combination of, it, it's a, with, within the tax forms that are filed with the New Hampshire DRA each year, it does report how, many cr how, how much credit is left that was earned in each of the prior years. So okay. each year that carry forward schedule is provided to the state. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm going to start my timer so I don't go long because I tend to be a little long-winded and I get all jazzed up about this stuff. So, My name is Kevin Kennedy. I'm a CPA. I have been for about 30 years in this great state of New Hampshire. Uh, I'm one of the managing partners at my firm, Maloney and Kennedy. I'm also a New Hampshire Society of CPAs board member and the other co-chair of its tax and legislative committee. Currently, I'm also a member of the Legislative Committee on uh, Potential Worldwide Reporting for New Hampshire, uh, a, uh, a bill which was introduced by Representative Schomburg. Uh, so, so far, they've discussed New Hampshire taxation of businesses. This part of the presentation uh, is to comment on topics including what needs to be considered when an entity is conducting business in more than one state. And if it has a multiple state filing requirement, how do you allocate the profit of that entity among the states that they have to file in? Uh, beyond that, we'll talk about what considerations uh, might be needed when you have separate businesses that are commonly owned or have some sort of common control, and whether or not they need to file some sort of combined tax return together. And lastly, I will touch base on some items with regards to foreign entities that have a, a connection to uh, New Hampshire taxpayers. So in this realm of multi-state taxation, the first term I'd like to bring forth is nexus.
Now, nexus, roughly defined, is the requisite contact between a taxpayer and a state before the state has jurisdiction to tax the taxpayer. Meaning, when does a taxpayer have sufficient presence within a state to make them subject to that state's taxing rules and regulations? Now, generally, if a entity has a physical presence in a state, you have nexus. Physical presence being you have employees there, you have property there, maybe you go into the state or, or you lease property there. However, many states expand the definition of nexus beyond physical presence, including New Hampshire, uh, to something that looks roughly like if you're doing enough business in our state, then you've got a form of nexus here. And this is often referred to as economic nexus, which is div different than physical nexus. Um, so the one hurdle that states have relative to economic nexus is what's known as a public law 86272. And this law says it prohibits a state from imposing a net income tax on a seller's business if the taxpayer activity is limited in that state to just the solicitation of orders. So if a business is an out-of-state business and all they're doing is, is soliciting orders in a state, this law says you don't have nexus in the state. This state can't impose its income taxation on that particular business. Now in recent history, this public law has undergone various challenges to its interpretation. Many of you might have heard this back in 2008. There was the South Dakota versus Wayfair decision. And the Supreme Court essentially said, instead of physical nexus for sales tax, not income tax, sales tax purposes, um, we're actually going to use an economic nexus policy, meaning that if an out-of-state entity vendor is shipping stuff to a state and they have enough presence, economic presence, not necessarily physical presence within a state, that state has the right to require this entity to collect and remit sales tax over to the state. And I know currently and in the past there has been some legislation here relative to this particular issue and the ability for out of state um, agencies to tax in state. And I'm not gonna get into that right now, but I'm just letting you know where, where public law comes into play here. Also, this public law, 86272, has been interpreted to apply only to the sale of tangible goods, real stuff, hard stuff, not necessarily to the sales of services and intangible goods. So, given all this relative to nexus, that's the, the first layer that a business has to consider. Do they have a nexus in a state? And if the answer is, yes, we do, then likely they have a filing requirement within that state. Once they've determined that, the next step is my next term in this arena, which is called apportionment, which has been used already. An apportionment generally refers to the formula used by a state to determine what percentage of the business's net income is allocable to it and is taxable. How do you apportion the pie among the states to determine what's, what's taxable? Now, previously, New Hampshire and most states applied a, a three-factor apportionment thing. They looked at property, they looked at sales, uh, they looked at compensation, and the percentages of these numbers within a state to the total were used to, in a formula to determine the bottom line apportionment or percentage that was taxed in a particular state. Many states, including New Hampshire recently, have moved to looking at just sales for this apportionment consideration. As a matter of fact, uh, this single sales effect in New Hampshire started this year in 2022, and you're probably wondering, and probably we don't know the answer yet, what's the effect on revenue by moving to single sales? And the answer is, well, it just ended like two weeks ago. We don't really know what that is yet. Um, and uh, I, I, I would be very curious to see if the Department of Revenue actually has enough information at this point to provide that. Um, and of course, nothing simple in the world of taxation, and there's lots of complications relative to apportionment. For instance, what denotes a sale, uh, and where did it occur? So many states, New Hampshire included, have laws and regulations defining um, how to interpret this. Where, where did the sale occur? Where should that sale be apportioned? Now for tangible property, often a sale would be considered in the state where the product was delivered, or potentially, it would be where the title of the property exchanged hands. Every state has their own rules. Um, New Hampshire addresses this by saying, regardless 
of the conditions of the sale. We don't care what the, the terms of the sales are, FOB, shipping point, or whatever. Uh, wherever the product is delivered, if it's delivered in New Hampshire, it's apportioned to this state. Now, the only hurdle that New Hampshire might have with this is, again, that public law and nexus issue, which is if it's determined that state doesn't, uh, that entity doesn't have nexus in New Hampshire, New Hampshire may not be able to tax the delivery, uh, the delivery of those goods in this state. Relative to the sale, now that's tangible property. Relative to the sales of services, historically, most states applied what was known as cost of performance. And cost of performance said wherever the work was done to, to provide that service, that's the sale. That's where the sale was apportioned. But recently, two years ago, New Hampshire moved to what's known as market-based sourcing. And market-based sourcing, which many, many states have, are now applying, means whoever, where, whatever state received the benefit, wherever the customer was for that service, wherever that state is that they reside, that's where you apportion the sale. So I'll give you a quick example. A graphic design person in New Hampshire gets hired by a Massachusetts company, and they're going to pay him $10,000 to come up with a logo. They do it, and they ship it down to Massachusetts. Uh, that was a service, creating that logo. Now, under the New Hampshire market-based sourcing rules, and Massachusetts has this rule as well, they both say that's a, that's a Massachusetts sale because the benefit for that service happened in Massachusetts. And these are new and very, very complex. I'm just hitting a very high level. Um, so now we've addressed the issues of nexus. We've addressed the issues of apportionment. Um, the next issue is what if you have a lot of companies that have some sort of common ownership or common control? Some states require you to combine these companies together when you report because they don't want you setting up different companies and shipping income off to other states. They want a level playing field. So this is referred to as a unitary filing. And right now, New Hampshire has unitary filing, and they require companies that meet the definitions of having companies that have enough common ownership or control to include all those entities on the return and apply the apportionment across all the entities. But the entities are only up to um, the United States borders, and it's referred to as water's edge. Once you hit the water, you're no longer going to include any other companies in this unitary filing. Um, so it has to be a U.S. company to be included in the unitary filing. The committee that I'm currently on is looking at the other side of things, which would be worldwide reporting. So you've got foreign entities that maybe have a relationship or ownership of from within the U.S., or New Hampshire company owns it, or individuals do, and they uh, potentially you would include the income from those entities on the New Hampshire return when you're reporting if we move to worldwide reporting. Uh, and that's what, partly what this committee is, is investigating and researching is what, what are the pros and cons of moving to that. Um, the, uh, the last item I will comment on um, relative to foreign entities is the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which was mentioned before, created a new level of foreign taxation. Uh, it used to be that foreign taxes, uh, the only time foreign income became taxable in the U.S. is when the money was repatriated. It came back from the foreign country into the U.S. The guilty tax, uh, which stands for global intangible low tax income, was a tax by the Tax Cut and jo Jobs Act that said, you know what, if the conditions are meet certain criteria, that foreign income has to be reported on the federal return. And you get certain deductions and you get certain credits, but you still report it on the federal return. The last budget, time the New Hampshire budget was done, it was put into place that New Hampshire would take half of that guilty income and include it on the business profits tax return. So New Hampshire is, get, is seeing to some degree a level of foreign income being included on the business profits tax return. Now we're still investigating how that is gonna affect if we move to a worldwide reporting module instead of Water's Edge, um, but uh, it's all part of the factors considered as we move through. And my 10 minutes are up. I know it was an awful lot to take on. I spoke very, very quickly because I didn't want to miss anything because I get really jazzed about this stuff. Did I say that already? And thank you for your time. That was excellent. Thank you. Any quick questions? No, let's keep going. Thank you. Oh. I just wanted to say he's guilty. <laughs> <laughs> you are right. Did you have a, so go ahead. Just one brief one. As I understand, as I remember, on um, we started mar market-based sourcing in 21. 21, that's correct. 
and we don't really know what it's done yet, but it looks okay. <laughs> oh, you. Uh, I'm not aware of the results yet. I think we might have put feelers out to the Department of Revenue, but I'm not sure they have enough information compiled yet either. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Nice job, Kevin. All right, Madam Chair and esteemed representatives, my name is Karen LaSalle. I am a partner with Plodzik and Sanderson here in Concord, New Hampshire, and we now have an office in Manchester. And as Robin noted, I'm the chair currently of the New Hampshire Society of CPAs, and we are so happy to be here today with you. And it's so great to see um, such a robust committee and, and so many new members today. So it's really great to be able to give this update on the new taxes. They have put me at the end here just in case people were sleeping. We wanted to wake you up with some um, a little bit easier taxes, if that says anything about my intelligence versus Kevin, but I'm going to be covering the interest and dividends tax. So probably one that you've heard of, um, a little bit easier of a tax, I will say. Um, on on a number of levels, the, the last one I'll cover at the very end. So interest and dividends tax is for really any resident of New Hampshire who or has been a resident for the year or part of a taxable period. It's for gross interest in dividends from all sources that exceed $2,400 for individual filers, single filers, or $4,800 for married individuals filing a joint tax return during a taxable period. For partnerships, LLCs, and associations, the entity has to have non-transferable shares to be subject to the interest and in dividends tax. Um, again, the gross interest in dividend income is $2,400 during the taxable period, and that has really been the threshold for quite a long time. The usual place of business is in New Hampshire for these entities, and any partner, trustee, member, or owner is an inhabitant or um, resident of New Hampshire. For estates, the estate of a deceased person who was a resident of New Hampshire for any part of the taxable period, and the gross interest or dividend, again, exceeds the $2,400. So when looking at what is taxable, uh, we actually, the Department of Revenue has come up with these really great kind of cheat sheets. What is taxable? What is not taxable? And if you're ever interested in looking, you know, you can look up an interest and dividends um, checklist. It, they have them for the business enterprise tax as well, which is really great. They, I'm not sure if we have one for a business profits tax, but it's a really great checklist of what is and what is not taxable. So I won't bore you kind of with the details of everything that's taxable and not taxable, but your typical interest that's taxable, your bank interest, credit unions, your bonds, um, municipal bonds, except for those bonds that are from New Hampshire. Um, interest that's not taxable, New Hampshire state and New Hampshire municipal bonds, individual retirement plans, KEO plans, New Hampshire housing authority bonds, those are all not taxable. Dividends, again, your typical bank dividends, um, corporate dividends, items that aren't taxable, dividends that come from capital gains, returns from capital, liquidating dividends sale or exchanges from transferable shares. Again, I'm just hitting on some of the key um, major ones that I tend to see, you know, so I don't want to bore you with the whole list. Again, it's a long list. Um, so, so know that there's, there's quite a few areas that fall into taxable and non-taxable. The exemption, there's the exemption that I talked about, which is also the filing threshold of the $2,400, but there's also a couple other exemptions in New Hampshire. So a $1,200 exemption available for residents age 65 years of age or older, a $1,200 exemption for residents who are blind regardless of their age, and then there's a $1,200 exemption for disabled individuals who have not yet reached their 65th birthday. The due date of the return is the um, same. It follows the 1040 due date. So it's the fourth month, the 15th day of the fourth month. So typically what we think of as April 15th, uh, depending on when that day falls. 
So I think one of the major things, though, that you need to know about the interest and dividends tax right now, the tax is currently 5% but it is set to be repealed. So for 2022, the tax is 5%. For 2023, it is 4%, and it's gonna go down each year. So 2024, it's 3%, 25, it's two, 26, it's one. And then as of 1-1-2027, the tax has been repealed. So the IND tax is going away. I do not, know myself i don't know kevin or if we've heard um in our talks with the dra what the the fiscal impact of that is i don't know that um personally but but i do know that that tax has been set to be repealed in 2027. any questions no so this brings us to the the part of the, oh you do have a question Representative Fellows. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to know. I see that most of you have been reading something. Can are those available to us to read or? We did not prepare formal handouts. I think I. Do you mind? I don't. We did not prepare formal handouts. Maybe we could ask them to come back when we're sure. dealing with actual legislation or revenue estimates to come back and maybe hand out some stuff then. Because right now we're doing the quick. Again, we're going to start mm -hmm. high level. We're going to have people come back. We're going to drill down. You know, so we'll start high level, but maybe next time you could have something you could share with us because we're taking copious notes, but there's a lot to cover here. Right. So, uh, Representative Almy. Thank you. One thing, one thing we have to remember about them is the closer that we get to March and then April, the less we're going to see of them. <laughs> uh, Unless your clients. <laughs> and I... I I was wondering on, I never really thought of the interest and dividend tax as anything except interest and dividends until fairly recently when the DRA started to throw in our faces that there is something called distributions, yes. which is quite large part of the tax. Mm -hmm. And how, how does distributions fit into your description of what you were telling us about? So the the distributions, it depends on the type of entity and distributions on entities that have non-transferable shares, um, depending on the type of entity, are taxable as interest and dividends tax in the state of New Hampshire. And S corporations, for instance, they're taxable no matter what, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, because I'm saying this off the top of my head. S corporations, they are taxable regardless. Entities that are like LLCs, limited liability corporations, limited liability companies who elect to be taxed as, a, as corporations who have non-transferable shares are not taxed as interest and dividends. So there's some nuances. So it depends on the original entity structure and how it's set up and then ultimately on how it's taxed. We do have a question. Yes, Representative. Go ahead. So you're not talking about RMDs. You're talking about share distributions. No. Distributions. Yeah, well, you, the word distribution is in there. Just trying to clarify. Do you want to? Yes. So R RMDs have to do with required minimum distributions, which are distributions from retirement plans. These are not the kind of distributions we're talking to within companies. Distributions from a company often are either dividend distributions or draws like a sole proprietorship who may take a distribution from his company or a partnership that may take a distribution from their company. Uh, and that wouldn't necessarily be labeled a dividend because they are simply taking the income out of the company that potentially they've already been taxed on. But under the rules and regs and the definitions, um, certain entities, particularly LLCs, when if the entity has a non-transferable share, non-transferable means you can't easily sell the interest in the company, those distributions under the current regs and rules uh, for a limited liability company are not considered dividends for the interest and dividends tax. But if it's not an LLC and it's a C Corp or an S Corp and there is a distribution, it's li likely to be labeled a dividend distribution subject to the uh, personal interest and dividends tax. I hope that clarified it. Thank you. Very, very helpful. <coughs> Quick question. You mentioned that the threshold for filing IND taxes hasn't changed in a while. 
Do you know when, how long it's been, the 2448? Ooh, uh, I think it was 1,200 for the longest time. I, I've been here probably the longest. I think I remember when it was 1,200. And I think it's been a decade or more before, since, since it's been changed. I think it's been 2,400. It's 2,400 per person. A joint return is 4,800. 40, yeah. uh, but I think it's been over a decade since I've seen it change, and maybe two. Thank you very much. Representative Almy mentioned that you'll be getting busier and busier with your practices, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, so if you have the bandwidth to put your notes into sort of an outline of things that you wouldn't mind sharing with committee members, that would be helpful, because we don't want to disturb you when you're trying to earn your living. But uh, that I think we all learned so much today, and we appreciate your being here, and would love to have those notes handy when we go back to those topics. I, I don't envision I'll, I'll have to do some spell checking, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I'm happy to compile uh, my notes, and I imagine our, my peers Thank you. are as we well, would appreciate and, and provide that. them to you. Thank you. Uh, Nothing we'll, fancy. We'll coordinate through Robert and Abbott uh, to get them to you. Great. Thank you. Can, anything else, committee members? Anything else, Robin? Okay. This is wonderful. We just dove right in. I <laughs> love it. Thank you so much. All right, folks, that wraps up our day. Thank you for coming, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 9 a.m. We will be in the Finance Committee rooms, 210, LOB 210 to 11. See you there. Mm -hmm.